بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Brothers and sisters and friends and respected ulama and respected elders, I greet you with the warmest Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Today's talk is going to be on transcending the isms. Because in the 21st century, brothers and sisters, we are affected and we are challenged by a tsunami of different world views trying to engulf our hearts and minds as Muslims. And there are so many isms and schisms to talk about, but I just want to talk about four, which I think really affect the intellectual and rational foundations of our deen. These are, number one, scientism. Number two, atheism. Number three, humanism. And number four, naturalism. I'm going to explain what these mean. But before I get into my presentation, I want to be a little bit cheeky and I want to talk about something called neoconservatism very quickly. Just around the corner in Washington, D.C., we have a very interesting individual called Pamela Geller. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide her. And she has created a huge campaign against Islam with big bill posters saying that Islam and Muslims hate the Jews, we're anti Semitic. And I think we need to actually do something about this. And we have to present a positive, articulate, warm, compassionate challenge to such filth, fallacies, and misinformation. So I just want to give you some tips on this issue. When someone argues and says that we're anti-Jew and anti-Semitic, all we have to do is actually tell them what Jews have said about Islam. If we go to academia and we really become nuanced and we understand what is going on here, we will understand that the Jews have nothing but good to say about Muslims and Islam. Let me give you some references. Number one, take Jewish academic historians. We have a book by a Jewish historian called Amnon Cohen. And Amnon Cohen wrote a book called A World Within, two volumes. And he collected a thousand records under the Uthmani Khilafah, the Ottoman period. And these thousands of records were the records of the Qadi of the judge, the Islamic judge. And he concludes as a Jew, that although the Jews had freedom to go to the rabbinical courts, the majority of the cases, they freely chose to go to the Qadi because they knew under Islam there was justice. Number two, another Jewish historian, Zion Zohar, he wrote a book on Sephardic Jewry. He said, thus, when the Muslims crossed the Straits of Gibraltar and the Iberian Peninsula, the Jews saw the Muslims as liberators from Christian persecution. Number three, another Jew. You can find his letter in Philip Mansell's book, Constantinople. And this Jew is a rabbi, and he's writing in 1453. What does he say? Oh, my brethren, oh, my brothers, Come to the land of the Turks. Rich are the fruits of the earth. We live in peace and freedom and we're not oppressed with heavy taxes. Number four, another Jewish historian, a 19th century Jewish historian, Einar Hegratz. He says the Jews live favorably under the Mohammedans. And I could go on and on and on. The point is, I think we must, we must be empowered with some information to challenge this ridiculous critique from a neoconservative like Pamela Geller. And hopefully I want to agitate your minds and let you go freely into our history to see that actually we were the saviors of the Jew. Take for example, Yuri Avnery used to be a Zionist journalist. This journalist said that every honest Jew must thank Islam for the preservation of the Jews. So hopefully I want you to become empowered so you could articulate a positive case against this Trash, frankly, it's just trash. Anyway, so let's go to the isms. Now, Sufyan al thawri made a very interesting point. Sufyan al thawri may Allah have mercy on him, essentially said that when a man is used to contemplation, he will learn a lesson from everything. And if we really revive a neglected ibadah in the Quran, which is tadabbur, 
tafakkur, contemplation and pondering. We will see when we ponder on these isms and schisms, we would really understand that they don't have any intellectual value or basis. And we will see that the Quranic worldview is the strong worldview that is not only rational, but in line with your fitrah, with your innate disposition. So let's go into these isms. The first ism was scientism. Now what does scientism mean? Scientism essentially says that all truths, for them to be true, have to be proven by science. So science is the only method to render the truth about world and reality. Science is the only way to establish truth. Now, in the very beginning, you might think, well, that's true. Everything true must be scientifically proven. But this is wrong. This is a 1960s outdated philosophical cliche. You don't have philosophers or thinkers or just normal people with a brain saying that everything true must be proven scientifically. And let me give you some examples. Firstly, the claim itself is self-defeating. It's self-defeating. It shoots itself in the foot. Because to say that science is the only method to form conclusions about the world and reality, that statement itself, it's supposed to be a truthful statement. But that statement cannot be proven by science itself. So it's self-defeating. Because scientism says that the only way to prove things is to use a scientific method. But wait a minute. Can that statement itself be proven scientifically? So it's self-defeating. Number two, science cannot prove necessary truths like mathematics. One plus one is equal to? Hello? Good. Okay, well, someone may say, well, if you get one thing and another thing, then you know the two things. Okay, let me just make it easier for you to show that it's non-empirical. What is one fufula plus one fufula? It's two fufulas. Do you know what a fufula is? Exactly. It's not empirical, but there are logical structures in your mind that allow you to form that conclusion. Another point to refute the scientism claim is to talk about logic. There are some logical structures in it in our minds that allow us to form conclusions about things devoid of empirical realities. For example, listen to this logic. Number one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Number two, the universe began to exist. Number three, the universe has a? Logicians. MashaAllah. Now that conclusion itself is non-empirical. Because what allows us within our minds to form that necessary conclusion? Where is that logical link? It's outside of the empirical domain. It's logical structures in our mind. Science also, or scientism, cannot prove ascetic and moral truths. Take love for example. What did the famous poet say about love? When the pen writes of love, it breaks in two. Because you can't really express yourself. But according to a materialistic scientific paradigm, love is like having lots of chocolate. Imagine going to your wife and saying, Darling, I love you. And she just looks at you scornfully and says, it's no more equivalent than having loads of chocolate. It's just chemicals in your brain, right? It, it, intuitively, you know that doesn't make sense. Take concepts of beauty and morality. These things don't have a scientific basis. They are non-empirical, especially when you talk about morality because science is amoral from that perspective. It tells you what is. It doesn't tell you what ought to be. Also, science cannot prove other sources of knowledge like testimony. Because if you study epistemology, I know it's a big word, all it means is the study of knowledge. When you look at the study of knowledge, you see that testimony, the authentic say-so of others, is a valid form of knowledge. For example, who believes China exists? Put your hand up. Who's been to China before? Hardly anyone. Who could speak Chinese? Ni hen piao liang. I said he's very pretty. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. So the point is, many of us know China exists, but we've never been to China before. We've never spoken to a Chinese person in China, never had Chinese food in China. All we've seen is someone who looks different that claims to be Chinese. And we've seen some restaurant that says Chinese food. And on Google Maps, it says China. 
All of this is testimonial. It's not empirical. But we will bet our lives that China exists. So it shows that a lot of our knowledge is established by the say-so of others. So, scientism is a false presupposition when atheists say, well, it has to be proven scientifically. Or when materialists say, well, it has to be proven scientifically. You just have to show to them, you're assuming scientism to be true. That that's the only way to form conclusions about life and reality, and that's simply not true. Does this make sense so far? You sure? <laughs> Good. Okay, the next one. Atheism. The most ridiculous ism. To be honest, this has nothing to do with philosophy, nothing to do with science, nothing to do with thinking. It's to do with psychology. Honestly, I really believe this. And many atheists, they couch their discourse in intellectual language just to cover what is in their hearts. Because I don't think it's an intellectual position. But in saying that, let's go to the Qur'an and find out how the Qur'an deals with atheism. Interestingly, the Qur'an hardly talks about atheism because... In a way, it assumes it's a spiritual, psychological phenomenon. But there is one or two particular verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran 52, chapter 35 to 36, Or were they created by nothing, referring to the human being? Or were they the creators of themselves? Or did they create the heavens and the earth, the universe? بَلْ لَا يُقِنُونَ Indeed, they have no firm belief. Now, this refers to the human being. But the ulama derive logical explanations for things that begin to exist. Because it assumes things are khuliqu, meaning they were created, they are muhdath, they came into being. So anything that came into being, that began, you can use this Quranic logic. What's the Quranic logic? Number one, things that began to exist, they either were created by nothing, created themselves, created by something else created, or created by something uncreated. So let's work with this logic. If the universe began, could it be created by nothing? Why? Because from nothing, nothing comes. If I have some nothing, and I add a little bit more nothing, and I add a little bit more nothing, and I sprinkle some nothing, and I do something else to the nothing, all I'm going to get is? Exactly, as in Urdu you say, Kuchne. <laughs> and I heard there's a saying called Muchne the Kuchne, right? <laughs> if you have a mustache, you have nothing. <laughs> Crazy stuff, man. Anyway, so <laughs> moving along. So from nothing, nothing comes. Now some atheists say, hold on one second, you have a quantum vacuum and that's nothing and you have particles emerging from this quantum vacuum. Now what's a quantum vacuum? Let me make it simple for you. Imagine you had a huge cosmic hoover and you sucked all the particles away from the universe. What's left is a quantum vacuum. Now the quantum vacuum is not nothing. It's actually something. If you read a basic textbook on science, it's a sea of fluctuating energy. It's a rich structure. It obeys the laws of the universe. So they're wrong. It is not nothing. So something doesn't come from nothing. So the next point, could the universe create itself? Well, this is flawed. And let me give you a very crude example. Could your mother give birth to herself? That's a messy example, isn't it, yeah? But the point is, this is wrong, right? Because self-creation implies that something existed and did not exist at the same time, which is a philosophical, logical contradiction. So the third point, could the universe be created by something else created ultimately? Well, intuitively, someone may say, well, maybe. Maybe this universe was created by another universe. But there's a problem here. Let's carry on the question. If this universe was as a result of something else created like another universe, and that is created, and therefore it requires another universe, and that universe was created by another universe, and that universe was created by another universe, and that universe was created by another universe, if that goes on forever, will we ever have this universe? No. So it shows that there must have been something that's uncreated that brought the whole of creation into being. Let me make this a little bit more simpler for you. Imagine I'm an American Marine and I'm going to shoot a bird. If only they shot birds, right? <laughs> so, may Allah guide us all. So if I'm going to shoot a bird, right, in order for me to shoot, I have to ask permission from the Marine behind me. If he has to ask permission and that goes on forever, am I ever going to shoot the bird? 
Exactly. Similarly, ultimately, the universe must have been created by something uncreated, which makes sense of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's go to the next ism. The next ism, brothers and sisters, is humanism. What does humanism really say, which is the growing anti-religious, passive, compassionate movement, actually? They basically say, you can live a good life without God. That's what they say. You can be good without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, let's really see what's going on here. What do they mean by good? Do they mean by good something that's outside of the individual mind? Do they mean by good something binding and objective? If that's the case, then you can't be good without God. Because to have objective good, you require God as a rational foundation for objective good. And let me explain why. Because Allah is the only concept, idea that transcends human subjectivity. Allah is distinct and disjoined from the universe. Laysa kemithli hi He's universal and outside of the universe. Therefore, he can make the universal command. And he is objective in when he commands something to be good. If you don't have Allah, you don't have a rational grounding for objective good. Why? Well, let's see the alternatives. Number one, biology. Number two, social pressure. Number three, something called moral realism, which I'm going to explain what that means. So can biology become a rational foundation for objective good? Of course not, because what does biology say? It says that we're just a product of a lengthy evolutionary process and our morals have evolved like our unwanted hair or teeth, right? And just like Michael Rules, the philosopher of science, he says, you think when you say love thy neighbor as thyself, you think you're referring above and beyond yourself. But it's illusory, it doesn't have any foundation. So biology doesn't really make morals objective because it's contingent, dependent, on biological changes which makes it relative. Okay, let's go to the next option, social pressure. If all the human beings come together, we're gonna to realize what's good objectively. Well, there's some dangerous ground here. If we take social pressure as a basis for objective morals, then how can we say what happened in Nazi Germany is objectively morally wrong? There was a form of consensus in 1940s Germany that it was okay to exterminate the Jews. There was a consensus. It wasn't majority, but there was a form of a consensus there. So if you take social pressure as a basis for your objective morality, you can't point the finger at atrocities. So biology fails, social pressure fails. What about moral realism? Well, moral realism basically says morals are objective and that's it. It's an atheist position to say, I want my morals to be objective without God, right? It's a desperate clutching at intellectual straws. But that is a flawed position. They're trying to have their cake and eat it. Because they're just saying morals are objective because they just are with no grounding. Well, therefore, I could say Islam is just true with no grounding. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the final prophet with no justification. You can claim anything. I can claim my mother is not really my mother, but she's a pink rhino that flew here from Pluto on a giant feather. Right? I deliberately say funny things so you can remember them forever, okay? It's called neuro-linguistic programming. So you can't have objective moral values without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, brothers and sisters, there is a contention. And the contention is called Plato's Dilemma or Euthyphro's Dilemma. Which goes like this. Is it good because God commanded it? Or is it good because the commands of God are good? It's a dilemma. If you take any part of that dilemma, then our argument falls. But it's a false dilemma. There's a middle way. God is good. His nature is good. He's Al-Qudus. He is the perfect, the holy. And His commands are derivatives from His nature and His will. Now some may say, well, how do you know God is good? Therefore, good must be external to God. No. Because God, Allah, is the definition of good. Why? Because He's the only being worthy of worship. And the only being worthy of worship is the highest moral being. Finally, brothers and sisters, in the last one minute that I have, naturalism. Now, naturalism is a key philosophy that permeates through our secular education, and it's very subtle and we don't understand it. Naturalism is the view that there is no supernatural, the universe is a closed system, 
Everything within the universe can be explained physically and via naturalistic means. And this worldview is an unjustified worldview, but it permeates throughout most of the secular education in the 20th and 21st century and affecting the minds of the Muslims. I want to show you that naturalism is a flawed concept and a flawed worldview by showing a recalcitrant fact. What is a recalcitrant fact? A recalcitrant fact, brothers and sisters, is a fact that resists a theory. For example, say we have the police, they come in and they take me and they say, Mr. Hamza Dzodzis, we're going to take you because we have drug charges against you, because at three o'clock today, you were dealing drugs. A recalcitrant fact to their accusation, a fact that resists their accusation, is the fact that I was here delivering a lecture, right? So that's a fact that resists their theory. Similarly, there are many facts that resist the theory of naturalism, that things can only be explained physically. And let me give you this example. It is you. Consciousness. Brothers and sisters, consciousness is the Muhammad Ali against naturalism. It knocks it out. It does the rope-a-dope, and it waits until naturalism is very tired. It's ready for the quick jab and the overhand right, right? I like boxing. That's why I use these examples. So. Because consciousness, for it to be explained comprehensively, you need to have supernatural explanations, non-materialistic explanations. Let me explain. It is well known in neuroscience that if I'm eating something, there's some neurochemical activity that they know that I'm eating something. They could even tell me that I'm eating with my right hand and I'm, that I'm enjoying it. But they can never ever tell me what it is like for Hamza to have a strawberry. They can never ever say what it is like for Fatima to fall in love. They can never understand what it is like for Abdullah to sit in this room and listen to Hamza speaking. This subjective inner experience is outside of the domain of the scientific, materialistic, naturalistic paradigm. Even if we were to know everything about the brain and all the neurochemical structures, we would never be able to find out what it is like for you to be you. This is called the hard problem of consciousness. As Professor David Chalmers and Professor Nagel have said, that the scientific materialistic paradigm can never understand this or even assert this or even comprehend this. Because if we were to know everything about the brain, we would never find out what it is like for Hamza to have a strawberry. This is the hard problem of consciousness. And therefore, a theistic explanation is the only adequate explanation because materialism fails to explain this. And let me give an example of one materialistic philosophy that tries to explain this. It's called type A materialism. Type A materialism basically says all of our conscious experience, even the personal subjective experience, is as a result of brain activity. But this is fundamentally flawed because it can't answer a few questions. Number one, when two different human beings have the same neurochemical patterns, they have different perceptions of pain. Number two, why does personal experience come as a result of that biological activity? And number three, you can never tell what it is like for that organism to be that organism, that conscious organism, even if you were to find out what's going on in the brain. So type A materialism actually says, let's deny the hard problem of consciousness. Let's deny that you are having personal subjective experience. It's just an illusion. One of the four horsemen of the new atheist movement, Professor Dan Dennett, he wrote the book, Consciousness Explained. And he basically said, forget the hard problem of consciousness. Forget the fact that you have personal subjective experience. It's just one big illusion. But... There are some professors who said, wait a minute, this is unfair. Professor Dan Dennett is not explaining what requires explaining, which is the fact that we have personal subjective experiences. So his book, Consciousness Explained, should have been called Consciousness Explained Away. So the point is, brothers and sisters, the existence of Allah or the supernatural is best explained is the best explanation to comprehensively explain the fact that we have personal experiences. Let me just summarize this in an easy way. If in the beginning of the universe all you had was matter, 
and you rearrange all of this matter, you will never get consciousness. But if in the beginning of the universe you had an all-aware being that created matter and created beings with an internal subjective awareness, then it makes sense that these two things can interact within this universe. It's simple as that. And consciousness is a recalcitrant fact. It resists the theory that everything has to be explained fundamentally in a reductionist, materialistic way. And to summarize, if everything is matter, then it doesn't really matter. So brothers and sisters, this is how you deal with the four isms that are affecting the minds of the Muslims. Take this further, develop it further, learn it, improve it, articulate it. Don't sit at home like sitting ducks, because sitting ducks, they get shot very easily. You know that, right? So start, قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ yeah, Be enlightened Muslims. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمُنُوا اسْتَجِيبُوا لِلَّهِ وَلِرُسُولِ إِذَا دَعَاكُمْ لِمَا يُهْيِكُمْ Oh, you have believed, respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger to that which gives you life. The ulama said you don't respond to this call, you're dead Muslim walking. Don't be dead Muslim walking, be alive, respond to this call. I love you lots. Assalamu alaikum.